All right, guys, it's seven. Let's get started. We got a lot to a lot to do, and um, people come in late. Um, you know that's fine. We'll let them straggle in. Try and you know if you can come on time so we can start at seven, get out of here. Um, but it's exciting. We're back. It's been a long time. We were chased out in March, and uh, you know we're blessed that we can come back and get together and spread out and uh, do this thing safely. So let's pray. Lord God, we thank you, God, that we can come together and study your word. Lord, we know that we know you need your word. Your word is truth, and we pray that we would learn and know you, Lord. That's the point of the study, is to know you. Please guide each one of us as we read during the week. In Jesus' name, amen. So 2,000 years ago, Jesus was in the garden, and he's praying to his father. God the Son speaking to God the Father. And it's an amazing thing if you really think about it. We have it recorded. We have what he said, what he prayed, and we can read it, and we're going to read it. Let me just show you one thing that he said here. Look what he said. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is our verse for the study. We're here to know God, not to gain knowledge, not to know about theology. We're here to know God who is our Father. And this is eternal life. We possess eternal life now. It's a really awesome and exciting thing. And look what else Jesus said here. Same prayer. They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. We're going to talk about that word sanctify, but it basically means cleanse, grow up, change, transform. But look what he says does it. It's the word. It's the word that will sanctify you, that will grow you. And that's true for all of us. So that's, that's what we want, right? We want to grow up and be more like the Lord to know him. And so to do that, we've got to be in the word. And that's why we're here is to study the word. God wants to know you and you to know him. Did you know that? He told me to tell you guys that. This is a personal thing to God. You are so important that he wants to speak to you and grow you so he can know you. And sometimes that's an amazing thing to think about because we think, well, gosh, I'm just a regular guy. I'm, there's billions of people on the planet. How can he have this personal desire and attention to know me? I don't know, but he's got it. And that's why we're here. He wants to know you. He wants you to know that God loves you. He loves you. Not just that God is love. No, no, no. There's a difference when you know that he loves you personally. There's a fire that's lit. You begin to serve God out of excitement, awe, wonder, not obligation or expectation, but that you're supposed to do this or supposed to do that in the Christian life. He wants you to know that he loves you, and the word is that gateway. The word, as I'm going to show you, is your food. And here, here it is. Jesus is the word, right? In the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus is the word. If we're going to know Jesus. we got to be in the word. And it's like I said, it's not obligation, guys. This is opportunity. Look what Ephesians says. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height. Here it is, to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may fill, be filled with all the fullness of God. This is a prayer for us. This is something that God wants for us to know, to be filled with all the fullness of God, to be on fire for him. We don't want to be lukewarm, right? In Revelation, when we get there, we'll see that Jesus spits lukewarm out of, their mouth, out of his mouth. We want to be on fire. But the key to that is being in the word, knowing God. When you know him, the fire's natural. And here's the promise. Look at this. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Wow. Well, his commandments are in the word. Jesus has a promise here, guys. 
that if you begin to get in the word and keep the word, there's going to be a manifestation, a manifestation of God in your life, an existential reality, an experiential reality. Now don't get too upset. You go tell Pastor Greg, Dr. Demon's getting Pentecostal on us here. Let's get the Baptist police out on him. Come on now. Look, a relationship is experiential, guys. It's a two-way street. That's what God wants. I don't know what that means for you. I don't know what it always means for me, but I've experienced some things, and it's, it's an awesome thing. So God wants you to experience him, and that's a promise. The goals of the study, to know God and grow in him, number one. Number two, to read and study the entire New Testament and gain an overall picture of the theme and how it flows historically and theologically. You should have that under your belt to see the integration of the old and new. We'll see that. Some of you guys are coming out of the Old Testament study. You're really going to see that integration. If you didn't do that uh, before, the next time around, we'll probably be back in the old. You can do that. So it's going to be a loop that, that follows. We're going to try and climb into the story and live there as an observer. I want you to really try and do that. Get yourself in the story as an observer sitting there, watching what's going on. It changes the way you read and experience the word. We want to rightly divide the word, right? 2 Timothy 2.15. We want to then make practical applications from the text that will help us. Right? We, we, we need help. <laughs> We're messed up. So we need practical application. And we want to sharpen and encourage each other. This is a group study. We're all in this thing together. I'll talk about that more. Now, just a few housekeeping issues. So we're all on the same page. This is not the Bible study. Did you know that? What did you say? What are you talking about? Okay, guys, this is not the Bible study. The Bible study is all week long with you in the Word, reading the Word with the Lord. This, I'm, I'm not the teacher. I'm in the study with you. I'm the organizer. I'm going to give you some handouts to help you. I'm going to say a few things once a week for an hour, but I'm not getting up here and teaching the New Testament. I'm not going to be doing that. I couldn't do it even if I wanted to. There's not enough time. The Bible study is the collective group of us together and each of you individually learning and reading. And I'll help where I can. I'll be the organizer, but that's all I am. So don't think I'm in a Bible study on Tuesday night and I show up. I'm in a Bible study. No, no, no. You miss the whole thing if you do that. The whole point is to be in the Word during the week. There's not that much reading in this, guys. The reading is pretty light. It's easy. It's way easier than the Old Testament. Those of you who came out of the Old Testament, we read Isaiah in a week, didn't we? 66 chapters. It was grueling. This is very doable. There's no excuse to not be able to read what we have to read in a week. There's none. So don't think that Tuesday night's your Bible study night. All week long is your Bible study night. And then on Tuesday nights, you're going to get a review, a few little perspectives, some handouts and some things that will keep you going, a chance to be with each other. That's a few COVID things. Don't come to the study if you feel sick. All right? That's obvious. Or if you've had an exposure that's bad. We should try and practice social distancing. This comes from Greg and me. Masks are optional, but if you want to wear a mask, you wear a mask. And let's respect each other's and our various opinions. There's a lot of strong opinions out there about this. Me, for example, I'm a doctor. I'm treating high-risk patients every day. So I'm trying not to get it, so I don't give it to them. And you would want your doctor to do that. And I'm trying not to get it so that if I, if I get it, I close my office for two weeks and, you know, 15 people lose their pay. So I'm not afraid of it. I'm not afraid of dying. I don't want to get it because I don't want to unknowingly pass it to my patients. And I don't want to have to close my office and put people out of work for two weeks. So that's why I'm trying to stay away from it. That's why I'm usually wearing a mask. So let's just respect. But I, I get other people's points of view. I get it. Let's just respect each other in love. That's what the Bible calls us to do. Respect on both sides. All right? We can't have public food or drink served. You want to bring coffee, bring a snack, you can do it. But if you were here last year, we were serving coffee. We were, I was bringing you guys little treats and nuggets and everything. I can't do it this time. Sorry. Gremlins. Pray for the study. The gremlins have been relentless. 
sabotaging us, messing up the email list, the text list, deleting things. I mean, it's just crazy. Um, bear with me as we get this thing started with all the little technical things, the texting, the email list. If you have a problem, call me, but I'm, I'm battling these little green men who are in sabotaging everything that I'm doing. So be, be patient. Do essentials. Read, you can do it, show up. Make it a priority, guys. I mean, I can't miss, right? I can't say, well, you know, I'm tired tonight or, you know, I want to watch my show or whatever. No, I'm not talking about if you had work or someone's sick or something like that. But last year we started with 50 and we ended up with about 20, 30 guys dropped out. Let's try and not do that. Let's, let's stay with it. Pray for the Lord to do a work in you that only the Holy Spirit can do. 90% of the learning or more will come from your own reading during the week. So make sure you're doing that. And we can't cover everything. There's just too much. The devil is going to do everything he can to get you out of this study. He's going to do everything he can. He is going to mess up your life. He's going to have you fighting with your wife. I don't care what it is. But don't let, when you see things getting crazy, there's something to pry to prevent you from coming here or doing your reading during the week, pray and realize what's going on. The devil hates men in the Word. He can't stand it. I mean, just this week alone, I've been barraged. Had my iPhone blow up and leaks in my roof and holes in my tire and um, you know, power outages. I mean, it's just been crazy. The devil was, even tonight, he was setting off the dawn fire alarm. It was crazy. So pray for each other, pray for the study, but just realize the enemy's going to come after you and try and get you out of the study. Don't let him take you out. Binders, assemble them at home. All you got to do is um, take your little uh, tab things and insert them, and you'll have a little file for every book of the New Testament so that when you get your handouts, you can file them. Then at the end, you'll have a nice little file system of maps and everything. So assemble that at home. Use your, use your dividers. Communications. You're going to get emails with documents each week. I suggest you make a digital filing system on your computer. Make a digital file of every New Testament book. And when you get the electronic copies, you're gonna, you got the paper copies, but file those electronic copies as you go along. Four Gospels, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, whatever, however you want to do it. Romans, First Corinthians, just take those things I give you and file them away. You'll use them later. You're going to get regular texts from me during the week, encouraging texts, the word. Do not reply ever to a regular text because people get upset with, with the, 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 the texting thing that, that can happen to that. So when I text you on a regular text, this or that or a verse, don't reply. That's just for you as a little reminder. Okay, we're going to have a forum and that's for announcements, reminders, Bible verses, but don't reply. But we're going to use the Group Me messaging app. If you haven't done that, download that app, add yourself to the group. Everyone has been sent that link. And then during the week, this is a great place for us to interact. I'll talk about that more in a second. Because we can discuss things. It avoids blowing up our phones. Uh, you can turn off notifications. I'm going to show you how to do that. And check it a few times a day. I really want us to use this, guys. We started off strong with it last year, and it kind of died. This is important for you guys to chime in and tell each other what you think, what you're learning, commenting. It is a great tool, and you can do it in your own time. We need to hear from each other. Everyone in here has something to teach and learn to give someone else, and that's what it's all about, the iron sharpening iron. Please use the app. Chime in. Be the first person to say something. Don't wait for me. We could do some neat things you'll see where I can, I can send out polls and let you guys vote anonymously on different things. Did Jesus do that or why did he do this? Whatever. You know, last year we voted on was Nebuchadnezzar saved and some different interesting things. But please use it. I really want to see us have a good turnout for that. Each session will be posted on YouTube the next day. You'll get a link in the email. None of those links change. My YouTube page channel doesn't change. You all already have it. Uh, I'll also post it on the group me app and the links and everything will be on the share file. You've gotten a link in your email to the share file. That's like a, 
a, a, a folder on the internet and you can click on that and as the books are added, you have access to anything in the study, the PowerPoint, all the handouts, everything from tonight. All those handouts out there are already up there in a digital format. The PowerPoint presentation is already on there. So you can download those files for yourself and have access to them at any time. Everything. And the link stays the same. Now, the group me messaging app. This is like what the main screen looks like. If you click on that right there, that little coastal icon, it's gonna bring up this window, okay? And see that little button there, mute. If you slide that to the right, then every time somebody comments, your phone won't notify you, because that can be annoying. And I actually recommend you do that, unless you don't care because we had people silencing it last year and then they never responded. But I understand that's annoying. So you just turn that to mute. It'll tell you how long you want to mute it for. I would just click always and then just check it twice a day at your leisure when you have time or when you feel like it. That way you're not getting bombarded when people are firing away and you're annoyed and then you're annoyed you're not going to use it. So just go on there and click mute and then check it at your own leisure, okay? This is what the New Testament filing system can look like. You just have a file for each folder that you create on your computer and you save everything. This is our schedule. You have a copy of this. This is week one, the introduction. And we're going to hear, hear the different weeks and what we'll be reading. I'm going to explain this section to you here. It's a little different, but everything else is very self-explanatory. Okay? Now, the reading is due on the date that you have it. So next week is week two. 825, you should have read in the four Gospels, the first section, the introduction to the king. Does that make sense? So it's due on the date that, that we meet. So you have all week to do it. Now, we're doing the four Gospels chronologically and in harmony. Because if, you, if you've noticed, a lot of the same stories are the same and they're told over and over again. So we're not going to read one and then read another. We're going to read them all together. And what you have in here is, see, this is your first week. See, week two, the introduction to the king. It tells you what to read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But if you notice, it tells you the event. And so they're all synchronized. So if you want to read them that way, and that's a cool thing to do because each guy will give you some different details that the other one doesn't often. And that's why God had different gospel writers. So that's a neat way to read it, to read Matthew on that story, and then see what Mark said, and then see what Luke said. What's the difference? Why did God give each guy give his perspective? Okay, and we'll follow this all the way through. These harmonies are difficult. This is built by two masters, Arnold Fruchtenbaum and A.T. Robertson. There's going to be errors in there. There's going to be things that don't exactly line up. If you find them, tell me, but it is really tough to put this together and have it all synced up. That's very hard. I took theirs, I've checked it, but I'm sure we're gonna find errors. Don't be frustrated if you find any, in fact, inspect a few. So, week two, the introduction to the king, you'll read week two. Week three, you'll read this and whatever's on the next page, all the way through. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Is that a very similar format to what Greg What's that? I have no idea if it's the same. It looks the same. It might, it might be, but I don't know. I would doubt that it's the same because everyone seems to do this kind of thing different. All right, just a few comments on how to read and study the word. Let me just tell you, give you a few analogies. Imagine that you're reading this book by Max Lucada, Six Hours on Friday. And you're reading it and you don't understand something and you're frustrated and you wonder why it's there. Now Max Lucado is sitting with you in the room. He's right there. Whenever you read the book, he's magically there just like he is. But you don't talk to him or ask him anything. You don't say anything to him. You don't ask him, you know, hey, Max, what does that mean? Or why did you put that there? And um, 
You know, he's kind of like, hey, why aren't you talking to me? That's what we do with the word. We've got the Holy Spirit in us. God is with us. And we read the word and we don't talk to him about it. When you're reading, you shouldn't be talking to the Lord. Lord, what is this? Why is it here? What can you show me? Talk in plain language. You don't have to pray and close your eyes. Just talk or even think as you're reading. What does this mean? What do you want to say to me? Talk to him. He's in the room. Don't ignore the author when he's right there. He's within you. He's not even sitting next to you. He's within. That can change the way you read and experience the word. I guarantee it. Don't make that mistake. Let me tell you another example. Guy moves in a house. Never owned a house before. They give him an instruction manual for the house. But he doesn't read it. He doesn't turn on the lights. He doesn't use the heat. He doesn't use the air conditioner. He's going to the bathroom outside. He's washing his clothes in the creek. He's drinking dirty water and getting sick from the creek water. He doesn't even go upstairs. He's sleeping on the couch. That's the way we often live our Christian lives. God's given us the instruction manual of the word. And there's all these instructions and all these rooms and all these things he wants us to know and discover that can change the way that we live. And we never read the instruction manual. And you know what? He'll let you live like that. So when this guy opens up the instruction manual and gets in, he's like, oh my gosh, I had a bedroom. I've got a bathroom. I can, I've got lights. I can wash my clothes. I've got clean water. You can experience the same thing if you get into the Word. You're like, oh my gosh. And let me tell you something. There's no end to it. It is endless. You will not stop discovering and growing no matter who you are or how far along you are. It's as deep as you want to go. So it is a carrot to chase. Read, discover, be amazed. It's said that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. We're going to see that. Be a Berean from Acts 17, 17 uh, 10. It says that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Do that. Question things. Ask questions. Don't believe everything you hear. Be a Berean. The Bible says that the scriptures are everything. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true, to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. What four things does the word do? It teaches us what is true, truth, the way things really are, proper beliefs about God and the world, the world we live in. It makes us realize what is wrong in our lives. It points out sin or wrong behavior. We need that, don't we? It corrects us when we're wrong. It identifies proper behavior. And it teaches us to do what is right, living according to God's law and what is healthy. So it says that it, it, it's, it's everything to us. If we look at the Old Testament and the New Testament, Genesis 25 verses 37 times. Isaiah 69 verses 104 times in the New Testament. Wow. Wow. When you come across an Old Testament verse, go look it up. Don't read through it. That is a window to open up the understanding because the original readers, they knew their Old Testament. That was their Bible. So when they heard that verse, they knew it. They knew the context. Dig. Those are pearls hidden in there. Don't miss them. Look at Revelation 249 references. Some people say there's 800 or 1,000, depending how you count. The New Testament uniquely displays Old Testament real life situations as principles to live by. This is kind of cool. So in Luke 6, we're going to read to, you know, to love your enemies and do good to those who hate you and all that. And you say, well, how do you do that? What's up with that, Jesus? I don't get it. Well, usually the living example of that is in the Old Testament. You go to 1 Samuel 24, you have when David spared Saul's life. Someone who was trying to kill him. He had a chance to kill him, and he didn't do it. So you can see then the relation where the, the Old Testament lives it out and shows you how it, can, how it can work in action, and the New Testament principle is there. Just a great example. So sometimes go back and look at those examples if the Holy Spirit brings them to mind. And just in terms of some basic principles for interpretation, 
This is a good little analogy. This is what Liberty teaches, where Greg, Pastor Greg went. Um, step one is you want to figure out the meaning to the original audience. That's always your first step. What did it mean to them or in their town? Then you cross the bridge and you find out what's the principle that can be applied to me. And then you see the meaning for us today or to me. Always start with what the original meaning was to them in context. Then transform it to what it means to you. Don't start what does it mean to me. What did it mean to them? Now listen, this is very important. The meaning is in the text. The meaning is in the text that was placed there by God, by the Holy Spirit, via the original author. God put the meaning in the text. Our job is to dig out the meaning in the text that's already there. Okay? You discover the meaning that's already placed there by God. That eliminates this, well, you know, to me, this means this. We're not talking application now. We're talking, what does it mean? What is it saying? Okay, you do that by looking at the original audience. Then you can say, what is the principle taught? And how does that meaning apply to me? That's the proper order to do it. Especially when you get into tricky waters. Not, what does this mean to me? You could mean anything to you. You could say, well, to me, this says this. Well, that may not be what it says. So be careful with that. We do not determine the meaning. We find it and we apply it. Very important principle. Never start there. Now, that's what this fancy Bible term is. I don't like to throw these things around. Bringing the meaning out of the text. Exegesis. I see Jesus is where you read in your own meaning to the text. And people do this all the time. They're saying, oh, well, the, you know, in Genesis 1, that a day doesn't mean a day, and it means millions of years and all that stuff. Oh, that's nonsense if you follow the principles that we told you to just do. What does the Bible mean? You must know what it means to the original audience before you ask what it means to me. Here's a great one. Follow this. When the simple sense makes common sense, seek no other sense, or you will make nonsense. <laughs> Follow that. I mean, it, God's not trying to trick us. So when something is plain and simple, and that's what it says, that's probably, believe it or not, what it means. Don't get too, well, in this I see, you know, this and that, and this represents that, and, and this and that, and the other. Be careful of that. Start simply. Build from there. Unclear or harder to understand verses never supersede plain and clear verses on a subject. We'll get to that, especially when we talk about losing your salvation. Remember that. When a verse clearly says something, it's never superseded by some obscure verse that we're having trouble figuring out. Right? Eternal life is eternal. eternal. You can't lose it. It's eternal. I mean, it's that simple. Eternal life's forever. So you can't lose it if you just look at that basic thing. Context controls the meaning. Watch out for proof texting a single verse. You can proof text anything out of the Bible. Really look at the context. And there's layers of context, right? There's the immediate context, in the paragraph, in the chapter, in the book, and then in the whole Bible. So context is really important. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to that as we go through. Let me just give you one quick example from Mark. You want to follow along on your Bible or your phone? Mark 3, verses 1 to 5. And he entered the synagogue again, that's Jesus, and a man was there who had a withered hand. So they watched him closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him, the Pharisees. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, step forward. Then he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they kept silent. And when he had looked around at them in anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. Really a cool miracle. I mean, the guy's there. He's got this withered hand. Jesus says, stretch it out. And as the guy stretches out, Jesus miraculously probably did about 30 different medical things to make that hand restored to new, just like that. And I'm going to show you guys some medical aspects of some of these miracles that really make the miracle really cool. When you understand what 
was going on and the tendons and the ligaments, we'll come back to this story, and what had to happen in those different muscles and all the nerves and everything to make that miracle go, it just gives God more glory and makes him more awesome when you realize what he had to do at the molecular level there. So if we look at this story, okay, so well, Jesus spoke the word of God, right? He's God, he's speaking the word, and his word had the power of God, didn't it? Only God can heal something like that, right? So Jesus is clearly demonstrating here that he's God. He's God over the man's illness, he's God over the Sabbath, he's telling them, you know, he, he can cure someone if he wants to, right? Pretty simple. The man obeyed. Jesus said, stretch out your hand. The man did it, and he was healed, right? The man obeyed the word. He heard the word. He obeyed the word. And in obeying the word, right, the power of healing was released in the obedience, right? Now, just begin to think about that. Okay, if I'm hearing the word of God and I'm obeying it, there can be power that's released in my life, right? You can begin to make that, that jump in application right there, right? Doing the word or reaching out to Jesus in faith restores the withered and crippled things in your life. We've all got something that's crippled and messed up from sin or whatever it is. Jesus wants to heal and cure it. But we're going to have to hear what he says to us and we're going to have to do it in faith, believing that he wants to cure or remove whatever that is. I'm not necessarily talking physical illness either. I'm talking the yucky stuff in our lives. Things we don't want anyone to know. Right? So obeying the word releases its power. You bring your weakness into the presence of Jesus and his word and you can have healing. And realize this, Jesus did not simply heal the man, which he could have, did he? He could have said, hand be healed. And whoosh. It's healed, right? But he didn't do that, did he? He made the guy act upon the word. Now, that man had that hand like that his whole darn life or for 30 years is what church history tells us. It's been a long time. How many people would really believe it? Just some guys that stretch out your hand that he could do it. I don't know. If I was back then, if I would have done it, I might not have. They're like, yeah, sure. Who are you to say that? But the guy did it. And we want to be that guy. When you doubt and you hear the word in your life, do it. Don't doubt. And the power will be there. So just a little example there. He asked him to do something that was impossible. And when you look at these stories like this, <coughs> changes the whole way you read the Bible. You can't wait for the next story so you find out what, what you can learn from it. It's not just another story of Jesus healing a man. Yeah, I read that story about Jesus healing the man's hand. He healed him. So what? Read it ten times. Don't do that. Look at it this way. What's that principle there? Hearing the word, obeying the word, bringing your crippled things into the obedience and presence of Christ. There's also an important concept we're going to run across that people are going to ask about. I'm just going to briefly explain it. It's called the already, not yet. And this has to do with the kingdom. The kingdom of God is here, right? Jesus said when he's here, the kingdom of God is here, behold. But it's not completely fulfilled, is it? We're dead to sin, Romans 6 will tell us, but we still have sinful natures, you see, right? Satan's defeated at the cross, but he's still wreaking havoc. Jesus is king and on the throne at the right hand of the Father, but the kingdom is not here totally and physically yet, is it? It's coming, maybe sooner than we think. The kingdom is present and future. So there's an aspect to the kingdom of God that's already here since the cross. Je Jesus lives within us, he's working, but there's a sense of the future where it's not yet fulfilled. And just keep that in mind when you hear some of these things. Right? The kingdom, some people say, is inaugurated but not consummated. And this is the time between the first and the second coming. We're living in that most exciting time. Be glad you're living in this time and not the Old Testament time. All right, this thing about sanctification. Remember, Jesus said, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Well, look what we're going to read when we get to Thessalonians. Thessalonians can be one of the early books in the Bible. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. 
A lot of people say, what's the will of God for my life? I don't know what it is. I don't know what he wants me to do. I don't know the will of God for my life. And they spend a lot of time wrangling them. I don't know. Right here it says, this is the will of God. And then we read this, we learn what it is, and we don't do it. Because, I'm going to show you, the will of God is your sanctification. That's being in a study like this with the Lord. Think about this. Knowing your father. Who can know their father better? The baby? The toddler? The little boy? The teenager? Or the, the adult? Right. The father, right? The father can know... Um, this guy can know his father better than them. Because why? He's more mature. He has grown up. He's spent more time with his father. He has increased capabilities in his faculties and mentals and, and capacities to interact and understand work and interact with his dad, right? Well, what's true physically is true spiritually. It's a great analogy for us, right? Now, how did they get from here to there? What did it require? You had to be healthy had to have some time in the game, and you had to be eating to feed yourself, right? Healthy eating time. And the Bible is going to provide all of those. The spiritual health is very similar. Book of 1 Peter 2, 2 says, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. The food is the word. If you're not in the word, you're spiritually starving. You want to grow, you want to grow up, you get in the word. Jesus said, Father, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. There we go. That sanctification, that process of growing up, being transformed into the likeness of the Lord. But look what he says to the Corinthians. Brothers, I cannot address you as spiritual, but as worldly. Mere infants in Christ, they're saved in Christ. They're infants in Christ. That means they're saved. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. They were spiritual babies. And those of you who remember the Old Testament, this is our mascot. We don't want to be no spiritual baby. I'm appealing to the pride of you men. You want to be a spiritual baby? I don't. Come on now. Let's not be spiritual babies like the Corinthian church. We've got to be in the word to not be a spiritual baby. Does the baby know he's the baby? He doesn't, does he? That means if you're a spiritual baby, you may not know if you're saved or not. You are, but you just can't comprehend it. Does he know he has a father? Kind of. There's this furry, fuzzy person that touches me and feeds me and pets me. Right? But you understand, as you grow spiritually, your ability to know that you have eternal life, to know your father, the sky's the limit. So grow. Don't be a spiritual baby. So sanctification, you can liken it to cleaning up, healing up, growing up. And the Word does it all. You read, you get in the Word and pray. The Holy Spirit does the work. That's simple. It happens on its own. You won't even realize it's happening. Right? It's a process where God slowly transforms you to become more like Jesus. It starts at salvation, is completed in heaven, requires your daily participation. It's in your heart, your actions, your motives, your dealings with God and others. It's the inside, not the outside. It results in love, joy, peace, obedience to God that glorifies him. You are set apart for God's purpose and service. You're in the will of God. And again, it's like in the growing up, cleaning up, and healing. Right? Growing up to be more like Jesus. That's what we want to do. Getting the dirt out of our lives. It's a slow process. But we need to be cleaned up. Think of this. Holiness is like health. If you're sick physically with a virus, a disease, a cancer, right? Think of sin and bad things in your life as diseases, infections, cancers, ruining your spiritual health. You want to be holy, you want to be healthy, you want to be clean, you want to get the, you don't want to, you know, we're wearing masks and running from the virus and everything, right? But yet we run right into all the spiritual things that are bad for us. Sin is like an infection or cancer. It will kill you and destroy you. It will ruin your Christian life. And the Word does it all. The Word will diagnose. It can take your temperature, you're hot or cold, you're on fire, or you're lukewarm. Right? It will diagnose your heart. How's your heart? Do you have a hardened heart? 
You have a, a, a saddened heart. It can look at your eyes, your vision. What's your spiritual vision look like? It can do spiritual surgery on you, right? Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing you into the vision of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow, marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It will go in and do spiritual surgery on you and help you. Now, surgery hurts, doesn't it? There's a healing process, but when we're done, we're better. So don't mind that when you pray and God begins to sanctify you, that you're going to have maybe some pains and aches from this thing. It's not all joy. But if you understand the process, you can endure it better. And the word is all different kinds of food. Each book has its own little nutrients in it. Think of it that way. Some things are like fruits and nuts. Uh, some things are like vegetables. Uh, some things are like broccoli or, or cauliflower. It's good for you, but no one wants to eat it. No one wants to read Leviticus. But it's there for a reason. It has nutrients that no other book of the Bible has. Trace minerals, like the minor prophets. Trace minerals are important. You don't need a lot of them, do you? But you've got to have those trace minerals or you aren't healthy, your cells aren't functioning right. Don't ignore the littler things in Scripture. They're there. They're trace minerals for you. Then you've got the meat. The Romans is the big old steak. Maybe three steaks that's so big. The word is milk, it says. The word is water, it says. The word, Paul ana ana makes an analogy with spiritual exercise. Don't take care of your physical man to the T, watching your diet, exercising, working out, eating all this great food, and neglect your spiritual man. Spiritual man's just as important, if not more important. Take care of your spiritual man equally. I bet you everyone ate couple meals this today, didn't they? No one goes a couple days without food. Don't go without being in the Word. Remember, it's your food. So the Word can diagnose and treat. A little point here, Psalm 119. I did a study on it one time. I can send you this file if you want it, or I'll put it up on the share file. I did a, Psalm 119 talks all about the Word. It's all about the Word. And I counted all the different benefits or blessings that it said that it had. I found 47 different blessings and benefits from the word 47. It's crazy. Nothing can do that, guys. Christian books can't do it. I've written two of them. Throw it away. Throw my book away. Get in the word. My book can't do this. Be healthy. Pray. Be in the word. Worship. Fellowship with God. Don't be spiritually sick. Don't let your Bible... Be dusty. Don't let sin ruin your life. And realize this. Did you know that starving people don't have an appetite? If you're starving physically, you reach a point where you're not even hungry anymore. So if you're not the least bit interested in the word, eh, you either don't have the Holy Spirit in you, but he doesn't want you starving, or you're spiritually starving, and that's why you don't, you don't care. But if you begin to eat, you can get your hunger back. You should have a hunger. You should have a hunger for the word where if you're not in it, there's a warning. There's something nagging at you that you didn't eat just like you would miss that food. You start not missing meals, you're, there's something in you that starts nagging at you to eat, isn't there? There should be the same mechanism spiritually when you're healthy. It should be there. Let it be there. That's why we're here. Now, very quickly, we're almost done. A little overview of the New Testament. If we look at how the Old Testament ends, right, we've got Malachi, the last book of the Bible. We had some of the prophets. Israel was brought back uh, into the land. They had some problems in Jerusalem, but they reset up the temple. And uh, the prophets, Malachi and them, were preaching to them because they were already forsaking the Lord. And then there's a 400-year period of silence here. 400 years, that's a long time. Think about how America's not even 400 years old. So it's a long time between Malachi and when Jesus is going to come on the scene in 30 AD. So you need to understand that because the Pharisees and all the stuff that's happening, there's a lot that happened in there. You could do a whole study on this history and it's worth doing at some point. 
And then we're going to add in the birth of Jesus. We're going to follow him through his life all the way up to the crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension. Right? And then we're going to go through the period of church history. And we're going to be moving towards rapture of the church, which Greg's been doing this week, so it's kind of good timing there. And then Greg's been going through all this stuff here with the Antichrist and the tribulation period. And then we're headed towards you know, the, the millennial reign of Christ, the thousand years, and then the final judgment, and then the final heaven. That's basically the whole flow of the, the New Testament. You should have a basic understanding of the geography of Israel. Get yourself a map, print out something like this. This, this slide is available to you. You have it. You, know, you have all the PowerPoint slides. You know, there's seas, there's rivers, there's mountains, there's cliffs, there's deserts, there's lakes. The geography in Israel, guys, if you've ever been there, varies tremendously. And for this little country to have all of that. And you should know the basic region. So we're talking about Samaria or Galilee or Decapolis or Perea or Judea. You should know and, and follow along. And if you don't know the location, just Google it real quick, Bible map, and it'll come right up on your phone and see where that city is. That helps you get in the story, helps you learn, follow the geography if you don't know where it is when you read about something like that. This is the Temple Mount area. This is <clears throat> Mount Moriah before the temple was built. And as we saw in the Old Testament, that's where Abraham offered Isaac. Abraham offered Isaac and the same mountain that Jesus was crucified on. We saw how amazing that was, that they were acting out the crucifixion a couple thousand years before it happened, right? Abraham was told to give up his only son on the mountain. That's where it happened. And then when they built the, um, the Temple Mount, they, this is what they did. They made a big uh, structure here. And that's where, this is in the New Testament times, this wall here that Herod and the built is unbelievable. If you've ever been to Israel, the stones are huge. So they transformed the mountain into a, into a mount, into a, a field by building this retaining wall and filling it up. It's an incredible feat. And now today, when you go, this shows you what's left. See, a lot of it's been buried and the city has been built up upon it. But there is a part here on the south end and in the western, that's the Wailing Wall where everybody goes today. But you can see it goes much deeper. And if you go to Israel, you can go down and go in that tunnel. I've done it and see the original foundation. And if you go down to the southwest corner, you can see the original height of it. So that's how it's kind of changed over time uh, with the city of Jerusalem currently. The only thing really exposed openly is this western railway wall, and that's why everyone goes there. This is the diagram that you have. Keep this. You'll use this through the whole study. This is the 27 books of the New Testament. This kind of organizes them for you, the biographies of Christ. We've got church history, the book of Acts. We've got instructions to the church, right? These are the letters from Paul. These are the general letters by different authors, Peter and Jude and James. And then we have the prophecy of Revelation, okay? Now, what below you have, and this is useful for the rest of your Christian life, these categorize the books into different major topics that they cover. So if you want to read about church structure and order, you read 1 Timothy and Titus. If you want to read about false prophets, you get to 2 Peter, Jude, and 1 John. If you want to read about uh, practical Christian living, you read these books. Or spiritual warfare, these books. These are the books about Jesus Christ, right? And it's interesting in that, you know, kind of uh, Hebrews focuses on him being the final high priest. Colossians, he's the head of the church. Ephesians, he's the body of Christ, the body of the church. And Revelation, he's the king of kings and lord of lords. So each of these books is giving you a different snapshot of the Lord. Uh, maybe you're um, <clears throat> in a trial. And you say, okay, well, I'm going to go and read, and read these books. And this isn't a, a comprehensive list, but it, it will hopefully help you. And you want to learn in your Christian life these things, because when something comes up, and you're in trouble when you're dealing with something, you need to know where to go. So we have four evangelists. We're starting off with the four Gospels, right? There's four Gospels, four different viewpoints, four different audiences, four different purposes. And there's unique and common material in each of them. You wonder, well, gosh, why did... Well, I don't know. The first time I read the, the New Testament, I wasn't saved. And I was actually trying to prove it false. I'm like, why are they telling the same story over and over again? I just read these stories. And by the time I got to Luke, I was annoyed. I read this one story two times already. Well, there's a reason. 
and you're gonna discover it. <coughs> this is a handout that you have, I'm not gonna go over it, but it gives you a basic idea of the different areas of each one. And just real quickly, you can see that each writer presents the Lord in a different way. Matthew, as a Messiah and King, he's writing to the Jews. Mark, as a servant, writing to the Romans. Luke, the perfect man, writing to the Greeks. John, the son of God, writing to the whole world. And we could go on and on with the different things in there, but each guy is writing to a different audience. God is, is presenting different snapshots of Jesus from different angles. Think of it as Jesus is standing here. We've got four cameras coming from different directions, and you're getting different snapshots of it. So keep a look at that as you go through. Very quickly, Matthew means the gift of the Lord. He's our first writer. He's also called Levi. He was a tax collector. He was one of the original 12 apostles. He left everything to follow Jesus, didn't he? He presents Christ as king. He has a, mainly a Jewish perspective and audience. He's going to have a lot of things. It is written. It is written as it was written because the Jewish people would understand that. It was written around 51 AD. He was martyred, to the best we know, in Ethiopia. He died for his faith. Mark is the close companion of Peter. He's called John Mark and several times in Acts. He's the cousin of Barnabas. It's a neat little pearl that you can get if you dig and search and learn. That's in Colossians 4.10. Barnabas is one of you know, Paul's companions. He presents Christ as the perfect servant. He ministered with Paul for many years and Peter eventually in Rome. He's not one of the twelve. He wrote down Peter's gospel around 59 AD. He has a Roman audience. Because we'll see that he will explain Jewish customs. He uses the Roman time system and he often will use some Latin expressions. So you'll see these differences when you read them in tandem like that. Luke, he's a Gentile physician. You learn that in Colossians. He joined Paul in his second missionary journey. He investigated the life of Jesus and the miracles while Paul was in prison in Caesarea. He interviewed eyewitnesses. Very interesting. He went and says at the beginning of his gospel that he wanted to see if these things were true. So realize he's a doctor. He went and interviewed people. Back then, doctors did not believe in miracles like this. So this guy was very curious, and he wanted to see. He could ask the right questions, test people, try and trick them to see if what really happened was valid. He's the only Gentile to write scripture. Think about that. He's the only one in the whole Bible to write scripture. He's a native of Antioch. He has unique medical language and perspective in his gospels. You're gonna see him mention things that only a physician would notice. Which hand was healed? That the fever left immediately, little things like this, or he'll use uh, certain Greek words there, which I'll show you. There is a handout uh, that I have only on the share file. And on that, it's called the medical terms in Luke. Luke has over a hundred unique Greek words, you wouldn't know it when you're reading it, that are medical terms that only a doctor will use, and they're only found in the Gospel of Luke and Acts. Proving, therefore, what, that a doctor wrote it, but that's another story. But it's really kind of neat to look and look up those words as you go through. I have them chronologically to see how he used unique medical terms in his Gospel for certain things. Some of them you'll even recognize. He wrote Luke and Acts. He writes to the Greeks and he presents Christ as the perfect man. And John is the apostle whom Jesus loved. That's what he calls himself. Uh, he focuses on the deity of Jesus. <clears throat> John and James were brothers. They're called the sons of Zebedee. They're also called the sons of Thunder. He wrote his gospel while exiled in Patmos around AD 80 or 90. They tried to boil him alive, church history says, and kill him. And they couldn't kill him. So they had to put him on the island of Patmos to get rid of him because they didn't want him around preaching the gospel. He presents Christ as God in the flesh. And look what Papias here, one of the early church fathers, says about Mark. There's some interesting stuff that we have. It's not scripture, but this is very reliable. He says, Mark, having become the interpreter of Peter, wrote down accurately whatsoever he remembered. It was not, however, in exact order that he related the sayings or deeds of Christ. For he neither heard the Lord nor accompanied him, but afterwards, as I said, he accompanied Peter, who accommodated his instructions to the necessities of his hearers. 
but with no intention of giving a regular narrative of the Lord's sayings. Wherefore, Mark made no mistake thus writing things as he remembered them, for of one thing he took special care not to omit anything he had heard, not put anything fictitious into the statement. So just one of the examples of how we know uh, very uh, accurately who wrote some of these things. And you'll see that Mark's kind of just these little snapshots, and they're all over the place, and he's not trying to put together a chronological gospel like Luke is. And it's, he has his own purpose in doing that. And realize that chronology is big to us. It really wasn't big to them. Matthew and them, they'll put things out of place for their own purpose. Sometimes for a literary purpose or a context purpose to teach a lesson. That's why they have them organized the way that they do. Of course, God did it as the Holy Spirit. But don't get hung up that the events are in different orders in some of the Gospels. In Matthew, it was this healing, this healing. In the Mark, it's that healing, that healing. That's not an issue. That They weren't trying to do that. If we look, this is going to be at a timeline that you get later. This will be one of the most important ones you ever get. And it's basically from the cross, the history of Paul's life and his three missionary journeys. And it shows you where each of the churches were planted and then when each of the letters were written. And it shows you where each of here the Gospels were uh, written. And there's where Luke looked in, in Caesarea. I won't read this to you, but you can look this up on your own. But again, I put in some of these quotes from these church fathers if you're, if you're interested. So we're doing a chronological study. We're going through chronologically, right? This is one of your handouts. This is the life and ministry of Jesus. And we have it broken up into sections. We're following along with the feasts of the Lord here, right? We've got Passover, we've got Pentecost, and we've got Tabernacles, the three main feasts. And we know where some of these are because they tell us in the uh, four Gospels, and they're mentioned, that allows us to set up the timeline and have an approximate, this is approximate order of, the, of these things that he did and how he did them. We've got John the Baptist, the ministry in Galilee, around Galilee, and then we can see we get into closer to Jerusalem than we have the Passion Week. And we're going to rewrite the introduction to the king. That's this first week. Then we're going to read the authentication of the king. That's in this section here. The controversy of the king. That'll be week three, week four, five, six. And look here. See, seven, eight, nine, and ten. A lot more detail on this final time, right? And that makes sense. That's the whole time where he's persecuted. He's going to... They give us more information, don't they? In as we get towards the end, that's why we're spending more weeks in this section here, in the crucifixion, the resurrection, and the ascension. And when we get to Acts, we will read the letters in the order they were actually written. So we'll read through Acts, so we know the story, and then we're not going to read, we're not going to follow the order of the Bible books. We're going we're to read Galatians first, and then First and Second Thessalonians, because that's how it happened. And we're going to kind of follow along and kind of pretend we're with Paul, and Paul had just been here, and now he's writing this letter back to the church because this problem existed. We're going to climb into the story. It's a better way to do it. We're going to look at some medical aspects of the New Testament and these healings. I'll show you them as we go. And these are just some interesting tables that I gave you guys. I'm a doctor, so I like to look at this kind of stuff. I spend a lot of time analyzing it. We've got some tables on the different miracles, what kind of diseases they are categorized, uh, all the individual healings, who tells which one. <clears throat> um, this has individual healings and group healings. I mean, you can look at it a million different ways. But it is kind of neat to, to follow some of that stuff. And then this is that chart I was telling you about the medical aspects of Luke. It's only on the share file. It's probably 10 pages long. But you can see here in chapter 1, there's one. And anything in green is a unique uh, uh, medical word that he uses. We've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 just in the first chapter there. And they're listed by there. And it tells you. Uh, the English word, the Greek word, and the medical usage in its description. This work's been done over a, a period of time, but it, it, it's interesting. And that's just a blown up view there. You can see where Luke is using these unique words there. Look at this word here. See this word here? 
When Luke says they're eyewitnesses, see that word autopsies? That's where we get our word autopsy, to examine, to look over in detail at something, to try and figure it out. That's the word that he uses for eyewitnesses there. He uses a medical Greek term there, so kind of neat. And I'm not going to go through this, but uh, if you have week, there's a whole thing on the reliability of the New Testament. Um, if you um, missed that, I, I gave a talk at Coastal, I don't know, maybe a month ago. It is on uh, the same website that you have to see the, the videos here if you want to see that. But the New Testament's reliable. Let me just say that. It is, I've looked at this in detail. It is so rock solid, it's not even funny. Do not doubt anything about the reliability of the New Testament. And I've got all these slides in here for you. This is basically the same talk that I gave um, at Coastal. You can watch that if you want. And then there's some people will question the authorships of the Gospels. Guys, this is, this is rock solid also. We've got church fathers quoting it. We've got all kinds of evidence from the manuscripts. And people who say otherwise are just trying to throw you for a loop. If you ever have any questions or concerns about that, and that's throwing you, it's bothering you, it's you nagging you, let me know or one of the pastors know. We can point you to some of the resources. I'm a guy who likes to question things. Well, wait a minute, how do we know that Luke really wrote it? How do I know? It says he's a doctor. His name's not written on there, per se. <clears throat> he doesn't identify himself. This is Luke. How do we know that he did it? Well, I showed you some of the things. We've got early people on telling us who did it. But and then we've got like, like, like the Greek words and stuff, all that evidence. So it's rock solid. If you have any uh, questions about that at all, you know, let me know. You can go through these slides on your own. So next week, we will go over that first section, the, the presentation of the king. You have your reading. Any questions? So tomorrow and after every meeting, you'll get an email and you'll start getting texts. The email will have the links. But remember, the links are the same every week. I'll attach whatever handouts were electronically, but remember, they're also on the share file. And I'll give you the link to the website if you wanted to watch the video, if you ever miss. The videos will be on YouTube, so you can watch them for wherever you want. And please, let's use the GroupMe app. Comment, talk, you have something to offer, you do, and, and we want to hear it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, God. Be with us this week as we're in the Word. Keep us safe, keep us healthy. And Lord, speak to our hearts. May we learn from you, Lord. May we grow. May we know you. May we be excited. May we be transformed into your image. We thank you that we can be here and study your Word, that we're able to do this, Lord. And we pray that you would speak to each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen.